And I'll now pass over to Rosemary Nixon, our chair of the day, um, who's going to come and introduce our guest speaker more to us. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Mark Brook, from the, uh, who's a chief executive officer of Lung, Lung, Function, Lung Foundation Australia. Um, Lung Foundation Australia is Australia's leading lung cancer charity supporting over 4,000 people each year by its telehealth and face-to-face -face specialist lung cancer nurse program. And they were appointed to advise the government in 2002 um, on federal and state governments on lung health policy, including the National Targeted Lung Cancer Screening Program implementation, implementation which will commence next July. And Mike will tell us about that. He was also previously head of Asthma Australia, but his term finished on the day that uh, of the event of the uh, thunderstorm asthma. You might mention that <laughs> very ironically. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for coming. We'd like to hear about why lung health matters. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary, and um, good afternoon. Thank you, President Catherine. Uh, why does lung health matter? If I was to open your chest up right now, take one of your lungs out, dissect it and lay it out, it would cover a tennis court. That's how big... Your lungs are the original filters. Think of it like those of you that drive a Mercedes, but more expensive. They're very, very good at keeping stuff out of your body. They act as a filter to stop all of the particulates that we don't want in our body from getting in there, and then they push out all of the bad stuff back into the air. Now... I'm from Queensland. I've been warned I shouldn't talk about the grand final, but um, I am a Fitzroy supporter from many years ago. Um, and I equally have a very unique sense of humour. Some might say a dark sense of humour. So what I'd like to do is probably take you through a bit of an anatomy about why the lungs matter through a number of analogies, give you an understanding about lung health and where it sits in the health ecosystem, and then tell you about the exciting things that are happening in lung health right now. It has been in the news for the last five years. And in my office, there is a $200 fine if we say the C word. And the C word is COVID. Because I think people got over it very quickly. Uh, but COVID really garnered the attention of Australians on their lungs like nothing else before. But I want to go back in history and draw a thread between Sir John Monash as one of your founding members and lung health. So as many of you know, Sir John Monash in World War I led uh, a, a magnificent group of uh, men and women. And Sir John Monash was particularly interested in what happened to his men's lungs as a consequence of fighting uh, against an enemy that was using uh, mustard gas. And we saw, and many of you may be aware, we saw thousands, thousands of allied soldiers die as a consequence of inhaling bad products. And so John was very fascinated by the notion of what lung health did. And indeed, he established one of the first scholarships that looked at lung health. He went back, when he arrived back in Australia, he wanted to follow up with his men, particularly those that were inflicted by mustard gas. So the thread between why I'm standing with you today and your Rotary Club is quite a long historical thread. I've also got, as I said, a reasonable black sense of humour. So when my icon, Shane Warne, passed away, I woke up that morning furious at him because he died of a heart attack and not lung disease. And those of you that know Shane, and I've had the privilege of working with him over many, many years, would know that he was a smoker. And let's face it, um, smoking gives lung health a bad reputation. But it's not on me as the Chief Executive Officer to condemn smoking. The great, our great Governor General, Sir Quentin, Bri uh, Dame Quentin Bryce, uh, tells a story as my former patron in another life of giving birth to her fourth child at Ilfracombe Hospital in central Queensland, where I grew up, and the matron giving her a cigarette in a hospital. 
It was a societal norm. And through our work and the work of many other health charities, we've seen a decline in smoking rates to now where we're talking about less than 10% of the adult population is smoking. Um, but you will not hear me condemn individuals because in demonizing smoking, we've had the unintended consequence of placing a stigma on all lung health disease. And that stigma has strangled research investment, community empathy, government attention, and public uh, considerations of lung health. And I'll give you a few examples. A couple of years ago, uh, within the federal government's cabinet, there were 16 members of the cabinet. Eight had lost a parent or a relative to lung cancer. Not one member of that cabinet would talk about that publicly as was the shame of knowing someone who had died of smoking related illnesses. So if we just reflect on that for a second, we went and did a, a unique experiment. I have a great relationship with my colleagues from the McGrath Foundation, and I hope you will get them to speak here. It's not a competition. Just give me more money. Um, we did an experiment where we put a McGrath Foundation nurse fundraiser on one straight corner and a lung cancer nurse and fundraiser on another corner, both with exactly the same white t-shirts on saying, I'm raising money for lung cancer and I'm raising money for breast cancer. Now, it will probably be of no secret to you members about which one came away with more coin in their pocket that day. One in three Australians, when we surveyed them in 2022, believed that if you got lung cancer, it was your own fault and you didn't deserve the same level of gold standard care that someone with breast cancer is. But I can tell you in 2024, more people will die of lung cancer than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and bowel cancer combined. More people this year will die of airways disease and lung cancer than cardiovascular and Alzheimer's combined. Now, these statistics are not made up. You can go to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and find them. And we find ourselves at a junction at the moment in lung health where we need to talk more positively about what lung health matters. So in the last six years as chief executive, um, I, I, I'm going to wander a couple of stories here and someone's going to give me a nod at 15 minutes. Um, my chairperson, Professor Christine Jenkins AM, a world-leading respiratory clinician, came to me on the 9th of January and said, do we have a business continuity plan? And I went, we do. Has one of our buildings burnt down? What's going on? And she said, there's this thing in China. It's just killed a colleague of mine, a research colleague of mine, and I don't know what's going on, but it has all the hallmarks of SARS. She called that on the 9th of January. We had a pandemic being called on the 23rd of March. Christine came to me a couple of days after that and went, something really is happening in the world of lung health. I said, what's that, boss? And she said, I've just had three colleagues of mine in Milan and Italy die. Senior respiratory clinicians operating a Milan hospital died from infectious diseases. And we began to understand what we now know to be COVID-19. But COVID had a silver lining it got us to start thinking about our lungs, much the same as in my last day at asthma, November 16th, 2016. I can still remember the day very visibly because I was sitting just down the road having a farewell lunch with my staff and my board when everyone's pages, uh, they didn't explode, everyone's pages started to ring and we ended up, uh, senior respiratory clinicians are going, I've just been called back to the hospital. I've just been called back. There's people showing up at emergency department, not able to breathe. And that was the asthma thunderstorm event that tragically killed nine lives. You might recall in 2019, 2020, we had massive bushfires all across the country. And I would imagine everyone here that was in the city that day would know what it was like for the first time to be truly breathless. Because you couldn't walk outside your office or your home and have an experience of not being able to breathe in very tiny um, bushfire particles. So here we are. We've got something the size of a tennis court when I spread it out. 
that links and keeps your body safe from all the contaminants in the air. And we know that it's not just a smoker's disease. We know that it kills more people than any other chronic illness, yet we have very little attention on lung health. No one's showing up to do a pink test. No one's showing up to do a bike ride. No one's showing up to talk about uh, lung health in a positive way. But three things have happened in the last five years which I think are worthy of mention. The first one is, uh, hands up if you don't have marble in your uh, kitchen at home, but you used artificial bench tops. And I can't use the brand name because I've currently got an injunction against me. Uh, but if you did use a product that begins with C and ends in stone, um, please, if there's lawyers in the room, just cut me some slack this week. If you did use that product, could you imagine that you were contributing to the death of 6,000 tradesmen and women? So you might have heard this word silicosis. It's been around since we were building the pyramids 2,000 years ago. But silicosis that attracted young men and young women um, building our wonderful cathedrals here in Melbourne, they, attract, they got their silicosis in their 60s and 70s, much the same as mesothelioma and asbestos. You know, workers retiring would develop this insidious disease. What we saw with young men and women working with artificial benchtop stone was that they were being diagnosed with something called, and it's one of Rosemary's colleagues, as someone who works in occupational medicine, Ryan Hoy, acute silicosis. Now, let me give you an example of what an acute silicosis patient looks like, because I've sat through many autopsies. These are young men, 25 to 35, largely unskilled, great tradesmen, some tradeswomen, but great tradesmen. They've normally got a wife or a partner, or a couple of kids, a mortgage. They don't have income protection insurance. They don't have a whole lot of super, but they're proud of their craft. And they install that in the majority of kitchens across Australia. As a consequence of cutting that without appropriate safety measures, they developed what's known as acute silicosis. Acute silicosis is more deadly than every cancer I can name. These young men, from point of diagnosis to the day they die, where they are literally drowning with dust in their, in their lungs, have five years. Five years. Um, and as of earlier this year, the federal government, to their great credit, banned the importation, sale, and installation of artificial benchtop stones, uh, benchtops. So now architects, of which my son is one, have to learn to use new products that will be safer to keep Australians' lungs health. That's the first example of what the Lung Foundation has done. The second example uh, is, is about lung cancer screening. For those of you that are current smokers who have smoked in the past um, and who are aged between the age of 50 and 70, from 1 July next year, you will be getting a free CT scan every two years. And why is that? 70% of all patients diagnosed this year in Australia will be diagnosed with late stage lung cancer, that's stage three and stage four, when as Rosemary can tell you, late stage cancer disease is literally incurable. 80% of the patients I work with are dead within nine to 12 months. 80% at late stage diagnosis. From next year, we will have the world's first targeted lung cancer screening program, bulk build through MBS, which will save 12,000 lives over the next decade. Now, I know of no other public health measure in my long career in working this that has that opportunity to make that difference. The great news is uh, that Heart of Australia, and I'd strongly encourage you if you can get uh, Dr. Rolf Gomes, the CEO of Heart of Australia, to come and talk to you, bring his toy. Um, Rolf is bringing the first mobile battery-powered, solar-powered CT to rural and remote communities in Australia. So our fellow citizens that live outside of, Australia, outside of major centres can have CT scans in their own community. And it's a global first. There'll be six of those uh, double B trucks going throughout Australia 
delivering targeted lung cancer screening. So that's our second win, we think. Our third win is somewhat controversial. I'm, I'm not a big fan of X or Twitter or TikTok or the other ones that people in my office who work from home tend to spend a whole lot of time doing. But I can tell you that I have blocked more people in the last 18 months as we debated vaping in this country than ever before. And it has divided substantial parts of our own academic community and the community. So everyone might be aware that there are now two areas of vaping. There are e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, which as of yesterday, you must go to a pharmacist to see. They've been outlawed in Australia. You can't go to your local service station, your local corner store, and buy this under the counter anymore. You can't import it from overseas. You probably can, and they will get through. Um, but it will now be illegal and attract substantial penalties, not for the individual who we don't seek to persecute, but rather the companies that are peddling what was the greatest lie in lung health in the last decade. So if you want to quit smoking, by all means, talk to a general practitioner. Don't do what the UK did and go and talk to the local Ampol service station spotty 15-year-old who will give you a vape. Don't take, if anyone in the room has hypertension, do you go and see Ampol for your hypertension medication? Because if you do, I'd ask you to probably reconsider your prescribing habits. But that's what the vaping lobby wanted us to do in this country. They wanted to make it so accessible, so accessible to our young people with no thought of the long-term consequences. So Australia was sold an absolute lie when it comes to e-cigarettes. It's third-line therapy for people that are trying to quit. The reality is, as, as a clinician, and I can tell you this now, the vast majority of people quit unaided going cold turkey after multiple attempts and hooray to them. That's great. That's great for your lungs. Not as good as wine. Well, I, you know, I agree with you. Wine's good for your lungs. It's okay. Not so good for your liver or other parts of your body, but your wine is okay with me. But what we were told was, and what we saw was an entire generation. Now, if any of you have got children or grandchildren, been to an 18th or a 21st or a wedding recently, you will have seen how insidious vapes are amongst our young people. They were literally at every party. I was at a 21st birthday for my nephew on the weekend and was amazed at the number of young people. I would suggest eight out of 10, never smokers vaping. And what we know is that that is not safe for your lungs. Go back to my, my tennis court analogy. Your lungs are designed to be filters and putting anything in your lungs other than clean air is going to damage them. The sad reality is it took us 60 years to make the correlation between tobacco smoking and lung cancer and several other cancers, or the 15 other cancers. It may take us 50 years to work out that vaping, if we didn't put that genie back in the bottle, was going to make a difference. So that, that legislation that was only enacted and came into reality yesterday, we hope will save lives and save lives over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I have a couple of, I have one last story, which I normally end on. So um, Dame Quentin does not mind that I tell this story. So um, I do have permission from her. Um, as, uh, as, as my patron, I have a very good friend. As a matter of fact, my best friend in the world is called Quentin, uh, the guy. And he phoned my, my EA. Um, well, he didn't, I thought he phoned my EA. And my EA said, I'm oh, Mark Quentin's on the phone for you. And I went, okay. But picked up the phone and went, what do you want, dickhead? <laughs> I'm really, really busy. I'm dealing with a pandemic. There's lots of stuff on at work at the moment. I don't have time for you today. Talk about something else. And in this demure comment, she said, Mark, it's the Governor General, Your Excellency, so good afternoon, Your Excellency. What would you like me now to do? And she said, just keep doing what the Lung Foundation has always done, standing up for people's rights in terms of positive lung health, thinking about stopping lung health in its tracks and preventing it, 
And she finally said, let's, let's not repeat the lessons we didn't learn of history because Quentin, and I'm allowed to call her that, lost four members of her family to lung cancer. Four. And she is incredibly generous of heart and spirit in allowing me to tell that story. So my take home from today is smoking is really hard. It's really hard to quit, but don't give up. Quitting at any stage of your life will make a huge difference. Try to keep your young people educated about their lung health. Think more carefully about the environment and the air quality that we breathe, because we now know, and I was saying to Rosemary before, the first recorded death of a child in a coroner's court in the United Kingdom at a four-year-old child linked to air quality was recorded last year. The child lived next, ne next to a main road, which had a substantial thoroughfare of trucks going back and forth, diesel engines. She was killed by diesel particulates. It's the first time in my professional life I've heard of a child dying of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a disease that normally kills many of us in our twilight years. So air quality matters. And finally, think about our own biases and stigma. If someone comes to you and, uh, and says, I've got a lung disease or I've got lung cancer, if your first words are, I didn't know you smoked, rather than, I'm sorry to hear you've got a cancer diagnosis, how can I help you? Then you need to check that balance. And why do I end on that? Because in 2013, my mother, Roberta, passed away from stage four lung cancer after uh, six months of being diagnosed. My mum was a general practitioner with over 50 years practicing experience and didn't recognize the signs. Um, and to her credit, again, of her generation, growing up in a small country community, we had her farewell and all the women from my dad's Rotary Club and the, my mum's tennis club and other people in the community, because she was a local councillor as well, came and said, Mark, I did, did your mum nip out the back and have a smoke? I never saw her with a cigarette in hand. I went, no, she didn't. But would it stop you loving her any less? So thank you um, for the great honour of addressing Australia's first Rotary Club. Uh, thank you for the great honour of being in the presence of a club that has celebrated the life of Sir John Monash as a student of history. Um, I've always uh, admired that, that particular chapter of his life and um, I've really enjoyed that. And I, I hope in, a, in answering some of those questions with my usual stupid Queenslander sense of humour that I've given you a small insight into why lung health matters. Thank you. It's terrific, uh, Mark. Um, we've heard uh, how important it is not to demonise smokers, which has been great, and also that uh, uh, emphasis on air quality, which Robert mentioned in his reflection. So call for questions. I think we've probably got time for about one question. Bruce. I'm interested in the addictive qualities of smoking. Um, of course, there's a social aspect, yeah. and you like to be doing the same as your friends. And uh, But to what extent is nicotine an important component of the addiction, and what can be done to reduce nicotine in cigarettes? Oh, that's, that's a great question, Chris. And if I could kill you with a thousand PowerPoint slides, I would absolutely get them up here um you're right it's actually not the tobacco um the tobacco burns a tar and creates a tar which goes in your lungs um that in and of itself is only about half the problem so what the uh tobacco companies did very early on was introduce the substance of nicotine which um there's an analogy I'll, I'll, I'll share with you in a minute but nicotine is the most highly addictive substance that we can provide you with uh, it alters your brain and imbalances your brain, so you want more of it. Um, uh, a former uh, very well-standing clinician that I worked with said, if we could put nicotine in Viagra, we'd make a fortune. Um, 
I can't believe I just told that joke again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in so much trouble. Um, but it's true. You know, nicotine is an absolutely addictive substance. So it alters the chemical, it creates a chemical imbalance for you to want to do compulsive. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna around this. There are individuals, people with mental health issues that will require some form of addictive properties to enable them to, to function at a normal level. Um, but what we've seen with Minister Butler and this government's changes to the National Tobacco Act in recent years is to start to down tritate or down play the amount of nicotine in it so that every, every tobacco stick will now have a warning on it. Um, not the packet, but every stick from next year, every packet will require an insert encouraging individuals to take up other options, quit, nicobate, other things. Um, but the best example, you know, and, and some of people that tend not to like the positions that the Lung Foundation have said, but um, nicotine is an occurring substance in tomatoes. Yeah. Um, is there anyone in the room addicted to a tomato? You have to have 5,000 tomatoes to have one packet of cigarettes. So um, seriously, unless you're in Ligon Street, you've got no excuse. Because that's the argument that we've been putting up for. And all the way through, and there, there is a really interesting thing happening in smoking at the moment. You may have observed in a lot of movies, a lot of shows at the moment, that there is a lot more smoking happening. That's not by accident. That's corporate predatory behavior and paid endorsement getting around Australia's very tough uh, smoking regulations. They are actually paying movie houses and actors to, to smoke and vape on TV. So the F1 next year won't have the, comp uh, won't have the car that has View, View on it, which is the e-cigarette manufacturer. It won't because you're not allowed to advertise that anymore. Find a new sponsor. Um, so the, the, the real problem, we believe, is the lack of transparency by these companies who say to us, and, and I think this is, I, I need to be careful again how I say it because I'll get another injunction, who say to us they want to unsmoke the world, but I don't see them wanting to unsmoke developing nations in the Asia Pacific region, where they are constantly fighting in those nations' highest courts to overturn plain packaging legislation that Nicola Roxon here in Victoria introduced. They want to stop the limitation of nicotine in their products. So Chris, it's a really fascinating area that intersects with how corporate should behave. And one of the things that my board and I have been calling on is large corporations that say that they are woke, inverted commas, to quote Ricky Gervais. And, and I have to say, companies, the large supermarket brands like Woolies and Coles and others, not just those, who sell tobacco and continue to sell tobacco, a product that kills three out of five long-term users. So I think we do need to take nicotine absolutely seriously, which is why we fought tooth and nail to get nicotine cigarettes, e-cigarettes banned in Australia, because it was hooking a neck, the next generation. They were going the opposite way from vapes to cigarettes. The only, the only demographic in Australia that's seen a small increase in traditional tobacco products is what age group? Young people, 15 to 18, 18 to 24. So we've got, we, we've learned nothing from the last 60 years and they've sold us this, quite frankly, lie. But it's a great question. Happy to talk to you about nicotine for hours because it's one of my, my, I've got to get off, one of my specialities. Thank you, Mark. Thank that you. was just fantastic. Thank you so much. But do not go because I have to present you with a gift to Dr. Gregory. They are two hundred percent wilderness wear socks made by our very own Phil Endersby. Uh, they're highly prized. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, do you need a photo? Okay. Terrific. Okay. In closing, I'd like to thank 
our visitors and guests for attending. Thanks to MC Bob Glinderman and Reflection Robert Fisher and our lunch set up and reception teams for their weekly effort in making this meeting happen. Uh, a reminder, next week we'll have our monthly evening meeting. The focus will be on mental health. It will be a free Zoom-only meeting. Our guest speaker will be Dr. Karen Musa, Emergency Physician, Director, Emergency Department, John Faulkner Private hospital and author. His topic will be From Defeats to Defining Moments, Unleashing Mindset Powers, 6pm next Wednesday.